Hello and a very big warm welcome to the SoulSync Podcast. I'm Jason Paul. If you're clicking on this podcast for the very first time, wondering what the Soul Sync is all about, well, let me tell you. We ask the questions here that matter to do with everything from spirituality, the spirit world, energy, healing, uh, paganism, crystals, astrology, and it's all designed to nourish your soul and illuminate your path forward. And if you're joining us again at the Soul Sync, welcome back. It's great to have you here. Now, in this week's episode, I'm talking to Dr. Rebecca Beatty. She is an actor turned pagan priestess. And honestly, I love this conversation so much that I've booked Rebecca to already come back on because we barely even skimmed the surface. She's the renowned author of The Way Through the Woods, The Wheel of the Year and Nature's Mystics. And her work as an author does serve as a guiding light through life's twists and turns, but her story is far more than the sub of her books. It really is a tale of transformation, resilience, and a deep-rooted connection to the natural world. Dr. Beatty's path is as diverse as it is captivating. From her humble beginnings as an actor, she embarked on a profound spiritual journey, ultimately finding solace and purpose in modern paganism and Wicca. But her journey did not stop there. With over two decades of experience in a drug and alcohol treatment charity, Rebecca's professional life intertwines seamlessly with her spiritual calling, offering a unique perspective on healing and social work. You're in for a treat here. I'm sure you're going to love it. Enjoy. So, Rebecca, a big welcome onto the Soul Sync podcast. Thank you very much. I'm really, really chuffed to be here. Now, I must admit, I'm really excited to have you on the show because me and my partner at the moment, we are so interested in all things kind of pagan, all things um, Wicca. And it's something that I'm finding so interesting in myself. So I think um, my my level of enthusiasm for you being on the show today is um, absolutely loads. You've got it in bucketfuls. So um, tell us. Obviously, we've introduced you just now. Tell us about you and give us kind of a flavour of your story and how you've got to be where you are. Yeah, that's a really good question. Where do I start? Start from the beginning. Okay, so um, I discovered the pagan path uh, sometime in my 20s. I'd spent my whole teenage years and my, my early 20s adamant that I was going to be an actress from the age of seven I decided I think it was watching the kids from fame on telly Mm. made me think right I want to be an actress and I was absolutely adamant that that was my path I really thought that that was my purpose in life was to do that and so I went off um, left Dartmoor where I'd grown up in the middle of all this nature sort of really in the middle of nowhere um left Artmore, went to university, went to London, thought life was all exciting out in London and that that's where you had to be to do everything. And I did do professional acting for quite a few years, but found that um, that particular career wasn't really fulfilling me. There was something missing. And I often talk about people having a gap that they're trying to fill inside of themselves. There's this, you know, it's a bit like when you're on the London Underground and it says, mind the gap. And we all try and fill it with either shopping or telly or, you know, all these things that are probably not all that helpful for us. Um, And and I was feeling the gap was widening. So I decided that um, I'd had a really bad experience in a casting where somebody was just horrible to me again and I thought okay this is this is it I need to take a year off go and find a bit of fulfillment somewhere and I'll come back to acting when I'm when I feel happy again Mm. Um, so I did take this year off and I'd started exploring paganism had been on a my last um one and only actually paid acting job in the whole time that I was an actress um had been doing a schools tour with Macbeth and I was out in rural counties and spending a lot of time in nature and I suddenly realized that this is what was missing that I had been missing Dartmoor so much and missing nature and then it kind of went from there I had a 
best friend who introduced me to crystals and the idea of oracle cards and we'd pick a crystal and an oracle card each morning before we went out on the the school's tour and then I started reading about paganism and and you know we had this uncanny knack of whichever town we went to in the country we would find the nearest witchy shop and go and have a look round and it, it, there was something about the pagan worldview that just everything clicked into place for me because it was a spirituality that for me is very embracing it's very you know it's we don't do the ists you know we, we don't do we're not racist we're not sexist we're a matriarchal um all embracing religion basically which says whatever your path is, is absolutely fine. You know, it's your path. Don't have somebody tell you how to do your own path, just embrace it. And that kind of worked for me where organized religions had failed. You know, they were all missing something. They were all missing either the sacred feminine or they were homophobic or racist or, you know, it was there was something in them that just didn't sit right for me. Uh, and I'm not saying that all organised religions are homophobic and racist at all, but um, there were bits missing. There were bits missing mm. that I found in paganism. You just bring in your own feelings and your own thoughts and your own beliefs. I can really relate to you in what you're saying, because I think what's taken me so long to um, kind of get to where I am in some respects on a spiritual journey is because... I felt such a disconnect to religion, but mainly because I felt gay. And I think for years and years, I've, had, I've, I've even for years and years had an issue with the word God. I've only recently become comfortable with that word. Yeah. So I, I can relate to you there. What is it about, obviously there's a lot to um, paganism, but what are some of the kind of learnings or philosophies that really drew you into it at that stage? And what kind of a, uh, impact did that have, have on your world because it se sounds like these were very aha moments that yeah, you yeah lots had. of them yes lots of them and ironically I was so at the point where I was I'd taken the year off from acting and decided right I was going to go and find training and I asked for a teacher and the teacher arrived just on time as you know this tends to happen um in this in this spiritual life that we live um, and basically the, the aha moments just kept coming because it was going to talks where people were saying to me, what you believe in is, is your own private thing. You don't have to declare everything for everybody. But generally, there's a reverence of nature. The, the whole point with pagan paths is we find our spiritual connection to whatever you want to call it whether you call it god i've heard it described as a good orderly direction if you can't work with the the name god or you know the universe the you know spirit whatever you want to call it that in pagan paths we all tend to feel that connection to the divine in nature because that's where it is it's you know nature is perfectly imperfect and it, it embodies everything I think that I end up writing about in my books about us being perfectly imperfect and just embracing that through nature. And a lot of the people I was training with in my early years, they they came from quite diverse and well thought out backgrounds. There was somebody who was a psychologist um, in my early years, I was studying neurolinguistic programming, which is another branch of, of um, psychology, a bit wacky, but it's definitely in there, um, and hypnosis. And I was doing classes at the College of Psychic Studies in London, learning about psychic development and mediumship and how you connect to energies and feel energy. Um, and all of it kind of came together um and so I'd be in these classes thinking that's really weird psychic school feels like NLP school and NLP school feels like witchcraft school and it was it was all kind of starting to feel like it was the same coin but just looking at it from different sides I've got a friend who um 
a Nigerian friend who used to say to me that when you're dealing with religion and when you're dealing with the idea of the divine, whatever path you come at it from, it doesn't really matter. It's same bush, different way around it, he always says. <laughs> You know, so it's, I, it's like, OK, that makes sense. I can relate to you there because I think that I'm getting to that place as well where I'm seeing, I think it's quite profound when you get to that point on your spiritual journey where all of a sudden the dots start connecting. And for me, they, they it was suddenly like it happened very quick, quickly once I think I'd understood a, enough of each bit. And I think this podcast is probably propelling me on that <laughs> journey as well. Um, in one of you, because obviously you've got um a, a number of different books, mm. um, and the one I just keep feeling very drawn to, which I do want to read, um, but I think like we probably all do on this spiritual journey, we have a bazillion and one books, but one that I just feel very attracted to is um, planetary magic, mm. and the energies, um, modern magic with seven energies. Can you, uh, I know I'm taking yeah. us completely off in a different direction already on the conversation, but tell me about what the book is about and what, what led you to write it and what is the seven energies? Yeah. So when I was learning witchcraft in my early years of coven training, um, and I was, I was in living in London at this point and attending as many classes as I could. And I ended up in all sorts of strange places doing some really weird things, but it was great fun. <laughs> and, and I was taught in my early coven training about pre-modern planetary magic, which is basically what the Wiccan path, although if you, it's, it, we're, we're a bit like, um, Jewish people in this sense that if you get three Wiccans in a room, we probably all disagree on what it is. But um, for me, in the tradition I was trained in, planetary magic formed the basis of everything. So every Wheel of the Year festival has a ruling planet. Every spell that I do is constructed from planetary magic. And it's an old, old, old school of magic which basically dates back to ancient Babylon so we're, we're going way back before ancient Egypt even to the the sort of earliest point of humankind where people were standing on planet earth looking up at the heavens and they saw that the stars the constellations moved around and they believed that we were on an earth-centric universe so they they really felt that because what they were seeing with their eyes was the heavens revolving around where they were standing. And they noticed that there were two luminaries. So you get the sun and the moon, which each bring some source of light to the planet. And then there were these five, what they called wandering stars, which didn't stay in the same place in the heavens like the constellations did. So they knew that they were different and they started to study them. And then over the centuries, this branch of magic goes through from ancient Mesopotamia to ancient Egypt to Greece to Rome, right the way through to modern witchcraft history. So it's gone all the way through um, to the modern era. Obviously, it's using a, a scientific worldview that doesn't really stand up anymore because we know we're not on an Earth centric universe. We know that, um, you know, we're revolving around the sun, not the other way around. But it's still this ma this form of magic works because this is what all the books of magic were written in. All the grimoires were written from the perspective of planetary magic. So we've got these five, you know, the two luminaries plus the five bodies. So you have, and if you're an if you're a modern astrologist, this won't make any sense because we don't have any reference to Uranus, Pluto, or the other one that I always forget. Um, because it's the seven that could be seen with the naked eye before, mm. um, you know, before anyone had telescopes or any of the whizzy equipment to see what was going on. So we have, you know, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Sun, Jupiter, Saturn, and I've probably forgotten one. Um, but those are the the main planets that we work with, and each one of those planets rules certain plants on planet earth and crystals herbs animals parts of the body all sorts of things so basically it's it's through a system of sympathetic magic so you have um if you're wanting to craft a spell say for love 
what you would do is work with the planet Venus because she rules love. She she rules all things love, romance, friendship, all the rest of it. So you would pick crystals and herbs and essential oils that are all ruled by planet Venus to help you in that spell working. And this is a system of magic that I was taught, like I said, from my earliest days in in um, pagan circles. The bit where I've kind of differed from a lot of authors is that in my worldview, um, it's a slightly different kettle of fish because traditionally all of the planets are assigned a gender. So you would have Venus is a, is a she, you know, the moon is a she, Mercury is um, non-binary, you know, it can be a he or a she. And I'm I'm kind of saying, yes, that's that's fab, but you don't have to work with genders in the way that they have always been seen traditionally. So if you're not, you know, if you're if you're non-binary and you want to work with, you know, say you identify as female and you want to work with one of the male energies, there's no reason why you can't work with that in a female kind of sphere as it were rather than the traditional roman god you know say mars there are plenty of feminine goddesses that are very like mars that you can work with instead if you don't like the the kind of traditional roman so i guess that's where i start diverging and getting a little bit um non-traditional with it Obviously, this dates back a very long time. And I, I, do you know what? I'm finding that even myself, I'm getting very much drawn to the era of before religion. And I think that this um, part in our world history is, is very important. How does kind of the pagan way of life influence the way you live your life now in the modern world? What practices do you uh, kind of use regularly or not regularly how do you apply this to your life interestingly i i don't see spiritual life and and i don't know what you describe non-spiritual life but i don't see them as different so okay. whether you call it some people call it mundane but i think that sounds really dull um but i i see this so my path is a i'm a wiccan priestess a high priestess i run a, a you know i've got a coven um and I don't see my spiritual life as separate from my working life, say. So for me, everything is an expression of that that life I've sworn an oath to, to, to my deities um, in service to them. So it's it's a bit like I've said, OK, I've chosen the life of a priestess. That means I surrender certain things to the divine um, and and I find things work better when I do that, because when I try and control things, it all gets a bit haywire and doesn't quite work properly. Whereas if I say so, for example, uh, if I decide, right, this is my career path and this is what I want to do, doesn't quite work in the way that I imagine it should. And I get really het up. So there's an element of surrender it to the to the divine and say, OK, show me what it is you want me to do this week what is the work that you want me to do and i'll i'll go and do it so and this is how i kind of fell into to writing was that i thought i'd be writing fiction um when i when i finished my phd i was a you know i was a novelist that's what i thought i was going to do and then i was finding that i was getting blocked you know i've got a, a phd novel i was trying to sell to agents and it just wasn't happening and it wasn't happening and i thought oh you know what i'll go and write a bit of non-fiction to keep myself busy and then that's what took off hmm. so you know i was thinking okay go and write go and write about planetary magic because i've been teaching that for 15 years write a book about planetary magic and that's what i did while i was waiting for um, you know the the rejections from the agents to come in um, and then the wheel of the year which was the first book I wrote for a mainstream publisher kind of landed in my lap because I was doing this thing of just show me what it is you want me to do tell me what it is you want me to do and I'll do it 
and had literally thought, okay, well, you know, I'd, I'd love to write a book on Will of the Year, but the publisher I, I usually work with had one already, had already commissioned one. So I sort of thought, okay, I'll just get on with teaching my Will of the Year classes. And then it was in one of those classes that one of my students said, oh, I've got a friend who's a commissioning editor who's looking for a book on Wheel of the Year. And she was thinking about all these different male writers. And I was thinking, oh, no, 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 this needs to be Rebecca that writes this. Are you interested? So it was like, OK, yes. Uh, you know, uh, Whose arm do I have to chew off to get get to write this book? So sometimes when you try and control things, it doesn't go the way you want to. And that's not what the world needs. It needs something slightly different. So there's this part of the, the life on the pagan path where I'm really mindful that there's a, an element of service to the community, service to the, the world, you know, world, if you want to call it that. I, I tend to try and pull things back so it's a nice small kind of you know world view so my day job working in the drug and alcohol charity for me um wasn't the life I planned you know I started working there 25 years ago had said to them I'm only staying a month don't get used to me um you know I was a temp and here we are 25 years later I'm still doing it and for me, that's another expression of the life of service because it's, okay, you think you want to do this. I oh, know we've got other ideas for you. You know, go and do this instead and make make something of it. I love the way you lead your life. I think that's... Uh, I do because I, I think that what you say about um, there not being a work life and a life is life. And yeah. I, I've stopped making that. Um, I, I've stopped looking at my life as work life and personal life and whatever. I, I don't think that's a healthy way to live um, because it's almost like you're dissecting your life. And I think so many people use this all the time. Say, oh, well, in my personal life, I do this. And in my work life, I do that. And I, I think life is life. So I do, I do agree with you there. I think your service to alcohol um, and drugs and helping people in that regard what made what's made you stay doing that for so long you know, some, sometimes I wonder <laughs> sometimes I think why am I still here uh you know I kind of think gosh 25 years you'd probably get less for murder um and and then then I find that um, so I came from a family of social workers. My mother was a social worker. My sister was a social worker. My sister-in-law was a social worker. And people used to say to me as a kid, are you going to follow in your mother's footsteps? And I was always, so as a child, I was quite controlling. I was adamant I knew what my life was going to be. And I used to say to people, no, darling, I'm going to be an actress. This is this is my purpose in life is to become an actress. And then what you find is what's really weird. It's like as a child, you're pre-programmed with a blueprint of how your life, you know, what's comfortable and what's what's homely to you. So it, when I came back from the same acting job I was talking about earlier, where we were doing the schools tour, I came back broke and needed to get some earn some money pretty fast and so signed on to temping agencies in London and the drug service was one of those temping jobs it was literally oh we've got this job nobody else wants to do it they're looking for somebody with a bit of personality and to me that tended to mean it's going to be a horrible job everyone's going to shout at me and I've just got to get on with it um, but they asked if I'd do it and I did and I, you know, as I said, I got there and said, don't get used to me. I'm not staying. But the people I work with are quite special. You know, they they are I find them interesting because they're generally very reflexive. They, you know, they are. I did all my learning how to be an adult in that space. So I, I kind of went in saying, oh, no, I'm an actor, I'm I'm special. And I came out thinking, no, I'm just like everybody else. You know, we've all got a part to play in this universe. But don't think that that makes you any different from the next person. It's, you know, there mm. but for the grace of God go I. So you'd be seeing people that are, you know, have had 
really traumatic lives who've had bad ex bad experiences and have made bad decisions for themselves and I kind of think sometimes that could be any of us really it could be any of us in that position mm. and if I I don't work frontline so I don't work face to face with the service users because I know I'm I'm too much of a sponge to sort of you know I'd end up taking up all the the emotional feelings of it and taking it home with me um, and actually it was psychic development training that helped me learn to differentiate between mm. my stuff and somebody else's stuff. And so it's kind of like all of these different things interweave through through my 20s and 30s. And I ended up just staying there because probably because of the people and mm. you can kind of make a difference even though you're not frontline. I can make a difference to the working lives of the people that are doing the frontline work. So I'm one step removed, but I'm still there. Um, and it does feel like it's all part of the same, you know, I learn so much from them. I learn so much in mm -hmm. that space that then, you know, the last two books, so Wheel of the Year and The Way Through the Woods, as, uh, as much informed by my work in that world as they are by my pagan view, it's just it's all been kind of squished together and um and and it's it's as i've got older it's starting to make more sense because it all kind of interweaves and it's all part of the same thing i must say being an outsider looking at your life with obviously a totally different perspective as as we all do when we're living our lives i can see uh, from standing back how it all kind of interweaves um the work that you're doing um in terms of drug and alcohol addiction and how that feeds into trauma and people living their life and it, it, there's a lot of connections to it i must say i love the cover of the way through the woods what a beautiful um they've done a good job they have done a wonderful <laughs> job do, do, uh, do you know what I, I there's so much i want to cram into this conversation mm. um the Way Through the Woods, The Green Witch's Guide to Navigating Life's Ups and Downs. Mm. Obviously, we're never going to unpack this whole book, even in an hour. Uh, but no. tell us about some of the learnings and things that people can perhaps um, give food for thought for with this particular book. Because we're obviously in a in an age now where I think so many of us are becoming more and more disconnected from nature than ever before. Mm. And, um, you know, that that is scary. That's scary about the direction that we seem to be going in. But t tell us about the book and some of the things that might give food for thought for people listening. So this this book kind of came about, it, it's a direct follow on from the Wheel of the Year, although they're two completely disparate books, but they, they are written in the same vein. So the Wheel of the Year talks about how we use the pagan celebratory system of, you know, nature's seasons and, and how you can use that as a reflection on your own life and what's going on for you on the inside. And then the way through the woods kind of came about ironically from a, a lunchtime chat with my editor we we went out for lunch to celebrate the wheel of the year launch and we were having this get to know you chat and it was all about you know what's what's your life like what's it been like and I started to share with them some of the life changes I'd gone through in the last um, you know 10 to 15 years really from that so I'd experienced the loss of my mother which was really really you know devastating I'd experienced a divorce I'd experienced um, a, a period where I went into therapy so I was really deeply in therapy for about three years because I realized that um, you know I did that classic thing where I was looking at my life's relationships all the partners that I'd been with who were all in varying degrees dysfunctional and you know not great to be around necessarily and then I did that classic counseling thing where they say okay what's what have all your relationships got in common oh oops that's me it's me that's unconsciously chosen these you know very unconsciously but this is the blueprint I've been programmed with and that's the life I've been living and so I went deeply into therapy for about three years to try and unpick all of that and try and 
retrain myself to not choose the same people and not make the same choices and what type of therapy did you engage in i had counseling um and it was it was a very chilled out relaxed i i found this lovely counselor who lived bizarrely just around the corner from me in london and and i used to go once a week and and sit there with with shirley and and we'd talk about stuff and it, so I tried various types of therapy and, and they hadn't worked for me. So I'd gone for, you know, the the there's I'm terrible at remembering the, the names of the different types. But Shirley was very much a sit and talk things through and then we would pick a topic and, and unpack it. Um, and I was with her for probably about three years. You know, it was quite a long, intensive process of really being determined that I wanted to change stuff significantly I needed to really make a difference to to how I was living my life and so the way through the woods came out from there that it was you know so I've written about the process of grieving and grief and how um you know if you've had a devastating loss how you might start to you know rebuild your life after that and then we did the divorce chapter and it's like you know okay you've had this divorce and I start the chapter by you know talking about the fact that when I meet people if you if they find out you're divorced they say oh I'm terribly sorry and I kind of say I'm not it's the best thing I ever did you know um and then we we move on to the positive changes as well. So there's also chapters about finding a new relationship and how that can really destabilise you as well. And you've got to kind mm. of try and hold on to your your inner sense of self while all this stuff is going on. And then there's a, a scary chapter. time um, when really? you get. I, I I've recently um, got into a new relationship, and I actually thought this is the the funny thing. I thought that, oh, yes, I'm independent now. I am totally full of self-love for myself. I am ready to enter into a relationship. Then I get into a relationship and I start to, all these old things of the past start flaring back up. And I was yeah. like, Jason, I thought you was <laughs> over this. Why? This. Why is this back here? Yeah. And, and then I start feeling that I haven't made any progress. But getting into a new relationship, it makes you very feel very vulnerable when yeah. you're you're single and you're in control of everything in your life. And it, it sort of destabilised me a lot when I got into a relationship and it made me feel bloody vulnerable. Um, so, And I'm guessing when you're talking about loss, this isn't just someone um you know uh, passing away this 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 is any type of loss whether any it's loss. a relationship a friend yeah. a crutch or yeah. and I think so, all of us can have some um I think we've all been in bad relationships and, and I think it's sometimes you even find yourself keep going back to those old patterns yeah. of behavior yeah. um so I, I thought you see when I I was a serial monogamist all my life from 16 to 40 I must have been about 45-ish when I got divorced or maybe a bit, yeah, maybe 46. Um, and I had thought, looking at my pattern of relationships, I'd gone from one relationship to another with very little gap in between. Uh, and and I realised that I was a serial fantasist because the people that I thought I was with weren't the people that I was actually with. So I'd build up this image of what they were in my head, which didn't meet the the physical reality in front of me. And then... What was I, it you were making them better or you yeah, were making them yeah. worse? No, okay. I was making them better. So I was, I was, you know, building this picture in my head. Oh, yes, they're lovely. They're really nice to me. While actually, in real life, they weren't nice to me at all. And... You know, they were treating me quite badly. And Why were you doing that? Was it the, the wanting it to be right? Yeah, and I think dodgy blueprint. You know, if you if mm. you start your life with, you know, you can start your life with a certain way that you're pre-programmed through your background and through your, you know, experiences as a small child and all of that kind of thing. And... And I just got kind of caught in this cycle of always doing the same. So although the people looked like they were different on the inside, they were very, very similar. So I, you know, I'd had one partner that was looked very different to all the others. So when people used to say to me, what, who's your type then? What's your type? I would say, oh, I don't have one, but actually I did. It's just, it was a psychological type, not a physical one. 
Um, and then I had realized this pattern was that I, you know, people have likened falling in love to being on a crack high. You know, it's, it's a bit like a cocaine high that you lose your sense of self because you're whooshing along on this, these, you know, these mm. really ecstatic feelings of, of, and, and I guess in my head, I probably prolonged that by building this picture of the person I was with that wasn't true, it wasn't accurate. And then probably the relationships came to an end when I realized, okay, the person in front of me isn't the person that's in my head. And then we would, you know, I'd break up and I'd be off to the next one. How do you approach relationships now being in the place that you really, are? Really interestingly, I, so when I went into therapy, I, made a decision that I was going to be single for the first time in my life. I was going to stay single until I'd worked out how to do things nicely for myself. And I can remember having a, having a discussion with a friend who I, you know, I went out for a walk in the woods with somebody that, that was a, a friend of mine. And I think he was hoping it would blossom into something else. And I was like, no, nope, I'm not going to be in a relationship with anyone until I can learn to be nice to myself in the process and I can make different choices about who I'm with. And the thing about my life as a, a pagan priestess, the bit I was saying earlier about surrendering, I realised that, OK, every partner that I'd been with in my life, I'd chosen and I'd done a terrible job of choosing these people. So I took the decision I was going to spend you know, three or four, well, whatever, however long single. And I would then, when I was ready, when I was really ready to go and meet somebody, um, I wasn't going to choose who it was. I wasn't going to make the first move. So I basically surrendered it to the, to the divine at that point and said, okay, I'm actually quite happy. I'd relocated to Devon. I'd come back home to Devon. Um, I'd always said in my marriage, if I get divorced, I'll just get a dog. I won't have another partner. I'll just have a dog and go walking. So I'd got the dog. I'd got the, you know, I'd relocated. I wasn't interested in meeting anybody and had actually done a spell for, and I did a love spell where I had chosen the qualities of, of you know, the best qualities I could imagine of somebody thinking that I would never meet somebody that had all these qualities so I'd be safe you know it's like if I design all these brilliant things about somebody so you know and then you'll never you'll never meet anybody that's that nice so it's fine you can stay single you know go walking on the moors with your dog and everything will be fine I and love then... the way that you've approached that you've done uh, uh do you know what that Anti makes me spell. do you know why that makes me laugh because I could actually see myself doing that um I'm going to make a spell that's so far-fetched <laughs> and that this person's never going to materialize yeah. Yeah. um and what a kind of uh funny dynamic that you're doing it but you're doing it because you want to manifest it, but you don't believe that's true. Yeah, so you, exactly. it, it's, a it's a bit of a bit of kind of psyching yourself out, isn't it? It's a bit yeah. of reverse psychology. But the main the main quality was that I wasn't going to go and find somebody. I wasn't going to look for somebody. I was adamant I wasn't going to do any dating apps or any of that stuff because it's just not for me. Um, mm. So it was, you know, I'd set up this thing. It was pretty tough that if I was going to meet somebody, it had to be in the real world. Um, they had to be, you know, somebody that would go on adventures with me, somebody I could have fun with and laugh with, somebody who would inspire me and would, you know, be charismatic and somebody I wanted to talk to. And we had a lot in common and all of this stuff. And I was thinking, you're never going to meet somebody like that. There's no way on, you know, on this planet you'll ever meet somebody like that. So you're safe. It's all right. You can sleep at night. And then... Uh, you know the the way things work. Uh, I went to a I went to a witch's circle and met my partner, and knew that knew that he was going to be my partner at the time because it was the div when you do witchcraft when you do spellcraft and it's a bit like when you work with divine energies and and the rest of it it always comes with a sense of humour. There's a a swift kick <laughs> in the pants you get when you do magic. And 
And I, it, you know, one of my names for God is the divine joker, because it's like somebody that goes, all right, then we're going to really mess you up now. <laughs> the, 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 the divine world does have a very funny sense of humour. And I think, yeah. do you know why? I, I've i toyed with why that could possibly be. Yeah. And I think for me, there is no better way to get my attention yeah. than to make me laugh. Yeah. Um, And I've had it before where I've gone... Get out of here. There's no way. Um, and that happened to me quite recently, actually. And it, it does have a sense of humour. And I think because yeah. laughter gets to us all, it goes straight to the heart. Um, so obviously, you you know what the next question is going to be, Rebecca. You you <laughs> met... <laughs> but, there's, but there's two questions, really. Yeah. One, um, are you still with this partner yeah. now? Oh, yeah. fantastic. right. Okay. We love a happy ending here yeah. at... Absolutely. What was the spell that you did then to uh, talk us through what you would do? The spell. So I, yes. it, it's actually in the book. It's it, it's in the way through the woods book. There's there is a love an anti love spell or a love spell that's in the. I think I put it in the new new relationships chapter, and it's using a traditional way of spell crafting called a witch's bottle, which. Um, Traditionally in history, people would create witches' bottles to protect themselves from witchcraft. Uh -huh. uh, it was a counter counter spell against witches cursing you, and you'd have somebody make a witch bottle for you, and you'd put in it things like I don't know, nails and bits of hair and urine and broken glass, and oh. it was all the icky stuff that was meant to you know propel the witchcraft away from you. Um, but over the years, we've kind of developed a way of working with witches' bottles, so you can bring positive things to you as well. So I did a, a I did a Venusian witch bottle, where so it's using the planetary magic. Um, I had slips of paper where I wrote on it the qualities of the person that I wanted to to bring to, you know to me or keep away from me, mm. whichever way I was thinking of it at the time. Um, so all those qualities that I wanted, you know, the charisma, the intelligence, all the rest of it, each one was written on a slip of paper and, and folded up and put into a jar. So you get a jam jar, basically a glass jar. It's very easy. Uh, it doesn't have to be a posh jar. And then um, and into that jar. So I did the qualities and then I put in um, seven is the number for, for Venus. So I did seven red dried red rose heads or you know seven pinches of rose petals mm. um seven pink crystals so it's rose quartzes or something else like that i put in um essential oils so i put in lots of venusian essential oils like rose like rose geranium like clary sage all mm. sorts of lovely smells um and a bit of i think i put some glitter in for good measure and I topped it up. The one I made at home, I, I actually topped it up with rose water rather than urine because you don't want to pee all over your, <laughs> you know, your <laughs> incoming partner. Um, and then what you would do is seal the jar, tight, you know, put the lid on the jar, take a pink or green candle, which is for Venus, carve on it a symbol for love and your own initials, and really focus on the feeling that you want to bring in, not the, you know, we don't name names when we're doing love spells because that's messing with people's free will. Um, so it was, it's the qualities that you want to bring in, not not the person. And then you literally um, anoint the candle with more rose essential oil and burn it on the top of the, the jar. So you attach it to the lid of the jar and let it burn out. How do you think it works? What's the what's I, I know you can't say the science behind it, but is it the intention, the fact that you're focusing so much See, on it, the ritual yeah. of it? Or I think there's a there's a bit of a mixture. And I it's funny because I was teaching a class on love magic this week and I was talking about the sources of power that we work with as witches. There are kind of three sources of power that we work with. One is the planet, the earth, and the and nature. One is ourselves as practitioners, so the, the any person, and you don't have to be a special witch to be able to do this, anyone can do it. We all have power within us. 
Um, and the third is the divine energy that you call on to to sort of help you. So it's like a three way mm. piece of working that you're doing where you're, you're co-creating with the universe to create this thing. And in my model of the world, so once upon a time, you would have thought, oh, it's occult powers that give this thing to you. I actually think it's our own unconscious mind that does everything. I think it's our, and this comes from the time when I was learning neurolinguistic programming and doing psychic school at the same time. And in both cases, what we were doing was working with our unconscious to connect to whatever's out there in the universe. Mm. So you've got your conscious brain, which is your bit that does language and it does um, it can deal with seven things at a time before it gets overloaded and conks out. When we do meditation, what we're doing is getting in touch with our unconscious. And when you're dreaming and when you're learning and when you're doing witchcraft, all of these things. And when you're doing psychic development, psychic readings, mediumship, what you're doing is bringing things through your unconscious and connecting to the universe mm. using your unconscious. So I think, and it's our unconscious mind that is able, it's very clever. It does our learning for us. It breathes our body for us. It does all sorts of things, but you have to learn how to communicate with your unconscious. Mm. And your unconscious mind has the mentality of a seven-year-old child so it can't understand negative instructions so if you say to you know if you said to a child don't drop that glass of milk whatever you do what's the first thing they do is drop the glass of milk and then it's that unconscious though so we have to learn ways to communicate with it we have to learn ways of getting in rapport with it and the, all of those symbols, those bits of planetary magic, the, the rose quartz crystals and the rose oil and all of those things are a way of communicating with your unconscious. This is what I want us to do. This is what I want us to bring in. And then your unconscious, because it's really clever, has this ability to filter out what it doesn't need and what it does need and takes you in the direction of mm -hmm. where you need to go. So part of the surrender, although I talk about surrendering to the divine, I'm also surrendering to the divine in me. I'm surrendering, allowing my unconscious to take me where it needs me to go. And the pagan path, what's different about paganism over most religions is that in Wicca, what we say is that the race of gods and men are the same thing we're all created from the same you know obviously i mean men women the rest of it um but humans and gods are made of the same materials mm. and we don't we don't kind of we see ourselves working in cooperation with the divine so we don't see the gods as being these far off perfect beings we see them as as being, you know, we're all made of the same stuff, which is why we're not perfect and they're not perfect. Mm. This is so fascinating. I Literally, Rebecca, I could talk to you <laughs> for hours and hours and hours and hours. There's, honestly, I find that um, paganism and all of that so fascinating. Um, Just to ask then, so we're, we're coming to that time of the year now where, February, spring is almost uh, upon us. In yeah. your um, teachings and worldly wisdom, um, on a parting thought, on a closing thought, what should people be doing um, at this time of the year to get themselves ready to have a great 2024 of abundance? Yeah, I would say a few things. One is um, go with the old ways, because this is this is where the wisdom comes from is from from the way that we've worked with nature for generations um the first thing i'd say is get out in nature as much as possible so there's amazing things happening at the moment out there so we're starting to see you know the the first signs of spring coming we've just had imolk which is the pagan festival or celtic festival that celebrates the promise of spring coming so we're not quite in spring yet but we've got snowdrops we've got you know catkins are out and the birds are going bonkers in the mornings and 
you know, there's this abundance of nature starting to pick up pace. So get out in nature as much as possible and just walk, you know, if, if it's a park, if it's a garden, wherever it is, you don't have to live in a rural setting. You can do it in the city just as well. Um, I used to go and walk in the city parks when I lived in London and go and watch the birds and see what they're up to. And our Celtic ancestors, for all of their Wheel of the Year festivals, would do things like have a good clear out at home. So this is the idea of spring cleaning gets us into this place where you're clearing out the old energy. You're literally sending out the old stale stuff, you know. So it might be that you do a bit of um, burning sacred herbs or incense to clear the air or and then opening the windows and, and letting it all blow oh, out. Wow. That's one nice way of cleansing your space. Um, and really for abundance, I think it's abundance becomes easier to achieve when you start recognizing where you've already got abundance. Mm -hmm. So I'd be I'd be thinking what would be really nice at this time of year is probably a gratitude list, you know, a uh, 10 things that I'm grateful for today. And and your unconscious mind works better when you're able to say to it, that thing we've got there that's amazing. I want more of that. Let's do more of that. Mm -hmm. So by recognizing where you're already abundant, you can encourage your unconscious to bring in more for you rather than it being a, a struggle. So that's what I would be suggesting. Well, there we go. Rebecca, um, I have to say, I have loved this conversation. If you do want to find... Oh, thank you. <laughs> it, I was going to say, um, if you do want to find out about Rebecca and her free amazing books, you can go to her website, which is rebeccabt.co.uk, and it will be down the bottom in the show notes. I have to say, Rebecca, I'm going to read all three of your books yeah. because um, they are all in their own right. They look absolutely fantastic. And I know that we've only just skimmed the surface, but... Thank you so much for coming on today. Pleasure. My pleasure. It's been really nice to see you. Oh, you too. Thank you. Oh, you too. Thank you. Now, wasn't that the most lovely conversation with Rebecca? I could have spoken to her for such a long time. I found her to be so interesting. I've actually booked for her to come back onto the Soul Sync in the summer to take part in a brand new series I'm launching this summer called Soul Sync Sessions. Now, what are Soul Sync Sessions? They are one hour to one and a half hour workshop style episodes where you can basically learn a particular topic and really uh, just go beyond scratching the surface, which sometimes is all we have time to do in these regular episodes of the Soul Sync. So I'm really excited to bring Soul Sync sessions to you in the summer. And now thank you for joining me on another enlightening episode of Soul Sync. If you want to stay in the loop with the Soul Sync podcast and know when new episodes are released, it's easy. Simply hit the follow show button wherever you listen to your favourite podcasts. If you want to get involved with our community and uh, find out more about the Facebook group, then just look in the show notes where all my social links are. If you have suggestions for future episodes or there might be a guest you'd love to see featured or you might even like to be a guest yourself, simply send me an email at hello at jasonpaulmedium.com. Your stories and ideas are the heartbeat of Soul Sync. I'm Jason Paul. This is the Soul Sync. Until next time, goodbye.